James chapter 4 on page 1215 of your church Bibles. James chapter 4, and I'll be reading verses 13 through to 17. Reading from verse 13. Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow we will go into this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, which sometimes brings, brings us up short. And Lord, we ask that as we look into your word now, that you would anoint me to speak, and that by your spirit you would speak into our hearts. Let us hear not the words of a man, but you speaking. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This section of chapter 4 begins with the words, Now listen. And they're the same words that my father would use if my sister or myself had overstepped the mark. Now listen. Or listen and listen good. When we heard that, we knew we had to stop and listen. Well, James uses this very same phrase. It's a very brusque phrase. He wants to catch our attention. What he's about to say is important, and it comes almost as a rebuke to the people he was writing to. Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Here, James is addressing the folly of arrogance, of making plans and leaving God out of the picture, of making decisions of ourselves without reference to him. And the example that he gives us is that of a trader going into a particular city, setting up a business, expecting to trade to be successful and make money. Now it is human nature to make plans, to decide to do this or that. The danger is leaving God out of our planning. Making plans and expecting God to bless them. So often, people expect God to be on their side, to bless their plans. Now, in the First World War, both sides were praying to God, believing that they were righteous, that their cause was the good one. Both sides were praying for victory. The Germans even had the words Gott mit uns, God with us, engraved on the buckles of the belts of their soldiers. Every army that marches out thinks that God is on their side. But God is never on our side. He's only ever on his side. This was a lesson that Joshua had to learn in the Old Testament. In the book of Joshua, chapter 5, before the battle of Jericho, Joshua met a mighty warrior who turned out to be a mighty angel. Joshua demanded, Are you for us or for our enemies? To which he got a sharp rebuke, because the angel said, Neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell prostrate before him. 
God is never on our side. We can never expect him just to bless our plans. To think like that is pure arrogance. We need to remember who he is. For God is God. The best we can be is on his side. We need to recognize that God is God. That he has his own plans and intentions. And as God, his will will always ultimately prevail. Now, as his people, sometimes we think that something sounds a good idea. And one of the biggest dangers in any church is good ideas. Surely, this or that must be the will of God. Surely, he wants to bless his church. Surely, he wants his church to grow. Surely, he wants to bless us. After all, we are his people. Yes, God does want to bless his people. He wants his church to grow, but it has to be on his terms, according to his will, according to his plan. If we are his people, we should be seeking his will. We should be seeking his face, seeking to find out what his plans for us are. If we are his people, we should be, we need to be, praying and seeking his will. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Well, that attitude is absolute arrogance. And that's a great folly. And if we do ever think like that, then we're setting ourselves up for a fall. And James continues, Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And it's true. We do not know what the future holds. We do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. We live in a fallen, broken world where bad things happen. So many people have made plans. The future looked bright. And then something hits from nowhere, unexpectedly like a comet plunging to earth, disrupting, destroying, bringing our plans to nothing. We do not know what is going to happen. The unexpected crashes in on our ordered little worlds. Sickness, an accident, a financial crisis, a marriage breakdown, an unexpected death. The world is broken and bad things happen. Over the years, I've heard so many people blaming God, saying, why can a good God allow bad things to happen? But they miss the point. They're blaming God for something he didn't do. Because in the beginning, God did create all things good. And in Genesis 1, as God had finished his work of creating, this is what Moses says. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. All creation existed in harmony. God, the creator of all things, was Lord of all. Everything was good. The tragedy was, that human beings were not satisfied. They chose to go their own way. They chose to throw off the lordship of their creator, thinking they knew better, and chose to disobey him. And that's the root of all problems. Human beings make plans. In the beginning, when God created us, 
he made us in his own image as living, sentient, reasoning beings able to choose our cause of action, able to make plans. We're not automata. We have the capability of choice. And that's the wonder, and it's also the problem. Under the rule of God, all is harmony. Without him, everything is out of kilter. Without him, there's disease in the world. There's conflict. There's death. When there are a billion people, each demanding things to be their own way, peace is an impossibility. But where God is truly Lord, there's harmony. God is good, but he's given us freedom. And freedom means the capacity to do good or evil. We're not automata. If you ask anybody, and I've done this in the past, if you ask anyone if they would want to be a robot with no will of their own, they'll always say no. They want freedom. And that, the tra that, that's the tragedy of the world. The world is broken. It's hurting. Bad things happen. We never know what the future holds. It's all because we chose. We demanded to do things our way. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Life is brief. We're mortal. We live. We die. And Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. Our bad choices, our sins, have earned us death. Our sins have cut us off from God, the giver of life. So we die. And if we die in our sins with them not dealt with, then we're cut off from God for all eternity. And that's hell. God is holy. He's perfect. And anything or anyone who is less than perfect is abhorrent to him. We earn death. We earn hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God loves us. It broke his heart to see us reject his lordship and choose to go our own way, to think we knew better, when his will, his plans are always perfect. It broke his heart when we chose sin. We're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And our Creator does not want to see us die and disappear into the darkness. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but has eternal life. And this is the mercy, this is the grace of God that Jesus came to earth to save sinners, to redeem fallen, broken, soiled humanity and bring us home to God, back into his will. In our first reading, Jesus said, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And that's the reason that he came. He was and is God, and he became one of us. He came to be earth. He came to the earth to be lifted up from it on the cross, to die bearing our sin, our bad choices, as the sacrifice of atonement, to clean us up, to wash our sins away, that we might be reconciled to God. The wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the key to that wonderful verse from Romans is the last two words, our Lord. For Jesus died for the sins of all humanity and he invites all to come to him, to believe, to accept him as Lord of our lives. And as we do, as we put ourselves under his loving, merciful rule, so we receive forgiveness and we receive life eternal as a gift. Life is to be had in accepting him as Lord. And the key to that is that word, Lord, that we put ourselves under his lordship. For as we do, so we're forgiven, we're put right with him. And in coming under his loving rule, so we re-enter that harmony, that peace with God that we had at the beginning. Sin is throwing off the lordship of our creator and it earns us death. But Jesus died and bore our sin for us, taking it into his tomb. But on Easter Sunday, he was resurrected, raised to life eternal. And as we accept his lordship, so we, e so we enter that life, that resurrection life, and that peace, and we're reconciled to God. In this world, with its brokenness and uncertainties, human beings walk in darkness. We can't see the road ahead. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But that need not be the case. In our first reading, Jesus said, whoever walks in, in the dark does not know where they're going. The future is uncertain and unknown. But Jesus invites us to believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. In a world of darkness and uncertainty, he offers us light. In an uncertain world, he invites us to put ourselves into his hands, to daily put ourselves under his lordship, and that he will lead us in safety. The future might be dark to us, we might not be able to see it, but he is God, and he sees all. He knows the end even before the beginning. Our futures are known to him and they're safe in his hands. We do not know the future, but if our lives are placed into his hands, we don't need to because we know that he will carry us through. Living under the shadow of his wings, we find security. His sight is perfect. His will is unchallengeable. And when we face difficulties and the unexpected, which we will in a fallen, broken world, he will neither leave us nor abandon us. He doesn't promise us an easy ride, but he does promise to get us through victoriously. Whether that means victory on earth or total victory in heaven. As Paul puts it, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So in him we can't lose. Our plans may well come to nothing. It's the will of God that counts. And if we're truly wise, then we'll put our lives and our futures and the future of our church into his hands. For he is God and he has a way for us. To quote the, the hymn that we're about to sing, I do not know what lies ahead, the way I cannot see. 
yet one stands near to be my guide. He'll show the way to me. I know who holds the future, and he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. So as I face tomorrow, with its problems large and small, I'll trust the God of miracles. Give to him my all. Let's forget our arrogant plans, because humble trust wins every time. Let's pray. Father, we recognize that we are a mist that appears for a short while and then disappears. But you have set your love upon us. You have given Jesus for us. So, Father, as we might remind ourselves of that, so we place ourselves, our futures, our plans into your hands. For you are God, for you are Lord, and in you, your plans will succeed. Father, we thank you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.